Spirit Catholic Radio presents a radio show for those of us cradle Catholics who might have forgotten some of the things we learned in school. And now, Cat in the Cradle, Catechesis for Cradle Catholics on the Spirit Catholic Radio Network with your host, Father Jeffrey Loski from St. Charles Borromeo in Gretna. Here's your moderator, Damian Montez. So, Father, the last couple of episodes, we barely scratched the surface, but now we want to do a a little bit of a deep dive. All right. How we get to talk about the Trinity. How often do we question, as as often as we're told about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how the Trinity is important in everything we Mm -hmm. do and in everything in our life, it's still really hard for us to wrap our minds around and comprehend what the Trinity is and what each part of the Trinity does and how each part is important in our love for Jesus and our Catholic faith. Uh, we're ready. We've got a scuba gear on. Let's dive in. <laughs> Damien, this, this is the central mystery of the faith. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so it's not just me. <laughs> That's right. Not only it is perhaps one of the deepest mysteries, but it also is the most central. So this is the, this is what the faith is all about. And this is what eternity is going to be all about, contemplating the Blessed Trinity, the Most Holy God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, why do we do the sign of the cross? This is all, all of these all things. All this is wrapped This up. is all, all right. of these things. So we, we talked about God being one, that there, there can't be multiple gods if God is God. There, there's perfection, and then there's not perfection. So God is, and and this God cannot be perfect alone that that relationship is important we know that as human beings that without relationship there is isolation and emptiness and and just a forlornness even if you're the biggest introvert which i am so i understand the necessity for the quiet but the need for relationship god has this built in in god's perfection there is perfect relationship so let's start with this notion of the trinity father son Holy Spirit. We begin with what we will call the first person of the Holy Trinity. All right. The first person of the Holy Trinity is traditionally called Father. And the reason we call the first person of the Trinity Father is because that is what Jesus Christ revealed. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But let's think about the the Father, the first person of the Trinity, as the source, the font, literally what it means to be. Like all of being is, is situated in God. In Scripture, uh, there is this moment when Moses encounters God in the desert, in the burning bush. So there is a shrub that is on fire and it is burning brilliantly, but it's not being consumed. And Moses gets closer and he wonders what this is and he encounters the presence of God. And when Moses asks, well, what is your name? God reveals it as I am. And in Hebrew, it's, it's made of four letters. We would translate those letters in English as Y-H-W-H. There are no vowels in, in ancient Hebrew. And so it, it's an unpronounceable name. We, we can kind of sort of give it a pronunciation by saying Yahweh, but it, it really does not have a, a easily pronounceable name. But it means I am. Am. When God reveals himself, he reveals himself as I am, which, which means I am what it means to be, I am what it means to exist, that everything that is, is somehow rooted in this mystery. And this mystery then, when we talk about God the Father, the source of everything, this is literally what it means to be. That source, that Father, that God, we've been talking about this these last few sessions, wants to reveal himself. He wants to be known to you. He wants you to know him. And the way he does that is he expresses himself. Now, if you or I were to express ourselves, uh, it would take me forever 
to fully express myself because I express myself in the way I dress. I express myself in what I do with my hair, with... Oh, you had to throw the hair part in there, didn't you? Man, it's Radio Damien. Nobody sees. Nobody sees that I'm completely bald. And he drops the hair joke because he's got a good head of hair. Well, that's a great expression over there. That's that's, you're absolutely right. That is the art that you produce, the work that you do, uh, the 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 everything, the car that you drive, the color that you paint your house, all of these things. These are expressions. Now, think of all the different ways you express yourself. There is no one moment when you fully express everything there is to express about you yeah but in god he expresses himself perfectly in one moment it's an eternal moment but it is one boom yeah. i am and the the one word then and we call it a word that god speaks because we're going to use human language now just to help us understand this not human God, that when you and I express ourselves, we use language a lot. And so we speak a word, and I have to speak many words to transfer what is in my head to your head, uh, which is what I'm doing right now. But God communicates himself perfectly. So he needs to say only one word. And the one word that God speaks is his son the second person of the Trinity. So we say that the second person of the Trinity is the perfect expression of the Father. It is the best reflection of the Father. It is the complete picture of the Father. I mean, literally, you could think about this as someone looking in a mirror, that there is the person, and then the reflection of that person in the mirror looks exactly like him, is doing exactly what the person in the in not in the mirror is doing, so that they, they, they literally are mirror images of one another. In many ways, This is what the second person of the Trinity is, that perfect expression of God that totally shows us who the Father is. Even in sacred scripture, Jesus will say to his apostles when they ask him, show us the Father. And he says to Philip, how long do I have to be with you that you realize when you see me, you see the Father? So if I look in the mirror and I see you, Damien, I know that there you are. Like that, what I see in the mirror is what you really do look like because yeah. you're reflecting that to me and, and vice versa. So that mirror, that, that expression of God, that is a perfect expression. You get everything you need in that one image right there. In St. John's Gospel, it begins famously, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now think about that in these terms, that in the beginning was this perfect expression, the Word, that was from the Father and is one with the Father. That the Word, that Word that you see there in in St. John's Gospel, that Word in Greek is called Logos. L-O-G-O-S. It's where we get our English word logo from, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's something that symbolizes or stands in for something else. Well, the logos literally means not just word, but that Greek word means meaning. It means purpose. So the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is what meaning is, is purpose itself. That, that this is what God wants us to know, that there's what my life means. There's the purpose of my life. It is found in this. And so we see now Father and Son, first person, second person of the Holy Trinity. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I was hoping you'd say it that way. <laughs> there is more. Let me go back to that mirror image that the father perfectly expresses himself and is reflected in the son. The light 
that is carrying that image from one to the other. Like you are not going to see yourself in the mirror if the lights are turned off. That light that that carries your image to the mirror, that is the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the the love that emanates between the first person and the second person of the Trinity, the Father and the Son. So we call the Son the Son because he has come from the Father. Like there is that begottenness. And that is what our creed teaches, that I believe in the Son, the only begotten Son of the Father. That there's only one expression, it is perfect, and it comes right from the Father, begotten of. That begottenness now, these two are in in love with one another. The Father loves His Son. The Son loves the Father. And that love is so perfect and so real that it is a person itself. That love is the Holy Spirit. So if you want to imagine the Father and the Son embracing one another, the arms that are holding them together That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the living love of God between the Father and the Son. It is a relationship, love, expression of one another. And and we talk about that Spirit as we call it Spirit, uh, and, and it says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. We say that in the Creed, that he spirates, that there is a life between the two of them that is constantly at motion constantly holding them together. So it really is the Holy Spirit is the bond of unity between Father-Son that unites Father to Son to Spirit. Let me take you one one step further. All right. So you have the Father and the Son and the Spirit bound together in this deep, deep love relationship. And that love is so perfect, it's infinite, that it overflows beyond himself and flows out to us, that creation literally is the product of the love of God, that that everything then that is in creation exists. It's an expression of God. It is of God. It is a sign of God's love. There was a beautiful reflection I read one time from Blessed John Duns Scotus, and he was a Franciscan friar, and he reflected as he was walking along the, the road one day, there was a leaf that was laying on the ground. And that leaf, he, he picked that leaf up, and in that moment, he had the realization that God exists because God is holding this leaf in existence. Like, I don't see God here, but I see this leaf here, and this leaf wouldn't be here if God wasn't here holding that leaf there. And so to know the stuff around us is also to know God very deeply. It's beautiful when you think about just where we can find this this triune God holding everything into existence. I'm so <laughs> caught up in in listening as a student that I get dumbfounded. That is not uncommon, though. When we really start diving in and listening to, you, we're, we're thinking about God maybe in ways that you haven't thought of him before. You know, maybe in catechesis or in, in, in grade school or religious ed or whatever, you know, you draw the triangle on the chalkboard yeah. in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You draw the three intersecting circles, you know. You draw the clover, yeah, St. Patrick. Right. You know, so we have all of these symbols and signs and images for God. And those are not bad. There there are ways to try to help us understand. But I want to take us, you know, that one step more deep into this reality to to really understand who this God is. Now, when we think about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have to remember that the Father is God, but the Father is not the Son and he's not the Holy Spirit, that there is something very distinct about who the Father is. And the Son is God, but he's not the Father and he's not the Spirit. And likewise, the Spirit is God, but he's not the Father and he's not the Son. So this understanding is that all three of these persons are God completely and fully. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Spirit is God. But they are not the other ones. 
Now, I catch myself using the term, well, you know, the Holy Spirit put me on this path. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Or should I be saying, well, the Holy Trinity put me on this path? You know, you, Great you want to make sure we're giving credit to where credit yes, is due, yes. even though they're all the same. To acknowledge one is to acknowledge the others. Yeah. One of the things that we recognize in our faith is that when God acts, uh, God, all three persons are always acting. Yeah. So this is where, you know, I would say probably 20, 30 years ago, there was kind of a little bit of a heresy that that kind of crept up in the church and particularly affected a number of baptisms where more creative, quote unquote, folks would want to baptize not in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but rather I baptize you in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier because they didn't want to use the masculine, quote unquote, patriarchal language. So let's call God Creator, Redeemer, Sanctifier. That's a problem because that's not the Trinity that we believe in. There is not a creator and then a separate one who is a redeemer and a separate one who is a sanctifier. God the Father was involved in creation. He was also involved in our redemption and he is involved in our sanctification. The Son was involved in creation. And again, all three persons of God are always acting in concert with one another. For example, let's go back into Scripture. Open up the book of Genesis. The very first words in Scripture that God creates the heavens and the earth. And it talks about the Spirit hovering over the waters of chaos. And that how does the God bring creation into existence? He utters a word. So the Father and the Son and the Spirit are creating equally. When Jesus is on the cross, he is dying on the cross. The Father is accepting that sacrifice to himself, and the Spirit is bringing the two of them together in that moment. That no matter what God is doing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always are working in concert together. The one cannot be working without the other. So you can say the Holy Spirit led you to this decision. You could say the Lord Jesus led you to this decision. God the Father led you to this decision. The Holy Trinity, God led me to this decision. Yes, you talk about Jesus as God, the Father as God, the Spirit as God. You mentioned, what was it, Y-H-W-H? Yes. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, I remember songs used to say Yahweh. Yes. Yahweh, I know you are near. Yep. And then a few years ago, Mm -hmm. we found out something about Yahweh or that particular phrase that was incorrect. Well, let me clarify. So the name of God is so very holy because it expresses a God that cannot be known until he reveals himself to us. Yeah that the the Jewish people in their relationship with God took that very, very seriously. And in fact, the second commandment uh, that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai says, do not use the Lord's name in vain. That and, and basically that meant we just do not say the name of God. Because to, to use someone's name indicated that you had knowledge over them, that you possessed part of that relationship. And so the Jewish people never said the name Yahweh. And even today, they would not say that. An Orthodox or a faithful Jew would not say the name. When you read the scriptures and that word came up in sacred scripture, instead of saying Yahweh, the reader would substitute the word Lord in there. So when you open up your Bible... If you look in the Bible and you're going through the Old Testament, every once in a while, you will see the word LORD in all caps. Wherever you see an all capitalized word LORD, that's where it's replacing the name W-H-Y-H, which is called the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter word. The Tetragrammaton is that holy four-letter word, not a curse word. Yeah. It is that holy, holy word. And so in English, in our Bibles, you will see that as an all-caps Lord or an all-caps God, G-O-D. That indicates where in the, in the scriptures, the actual name 
Yahweh is, is printed. So the Jewish people, they would then, in order to read these non, remember I told you there were no vowels in, in Hebrew, in order to be able to read this aloud, they would add breathing marks on to their to their letters so that you would kind of know what to say and how to pronounce these words. So every time the word Y-H-W-H, the tetragrammaton appeared, they wrote the vowels for Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord, above it. So every time they came across the tetragrammaton, they would say Adonai, Lord, instead of saying the name of God. Interesting side note here, Damien. Yeah. If you've ever had someone knock on the door and ask you if you wanted to learn about the Jehovah's Witnesses and about this God named Jehovah, Mm -hmm. uh, the word Jehovah is an amalgamation of the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. But in German, the Y sound is made with a J. Yeah. Yeah. So you get J-H-W-H. And then you plug in the vowels for Adonai, and you are going to get Jehovah instead of Yahweh. So whoever came up with the name Jehovah did not know how to read scripture and took the consonants from one word and the vowels from another word and put them together and came up with some made-up name. The next time someone comes knocking on your door and asks you, tells you that they uh, want you to meet Jehovah, you can ask them, what is the history of this Jehovah? Do you actually know where that name comes from? And can you explain that to me? Because I will bet you nine times out of ten, they cannot. Well, I can now. Yeah, you, you can. <laughs> so I can have that discussion with them. Something that you have learned. He's like, well, let me tell you then. <laughs> exactly. According to Father Jeffrey Lowski, he said, <laughs> and I quote. Exactly. So, So the holy name of God, very, very, uh, it, it signifies the whole Trinity. So when that word, that's not the name of the Father, that's not the name of the Spirit, that is the name of God, that, 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 that unpronounceable word. So uh, several years ago, Pope Benedict asked that all Catholics remove any English translation, Yahweh, mm-hmm. from the liturgy. So if we sang a song or whatever, that we were to remove that and replace it with Adonai, with O Lord, Mm -hmm. primarily out of respect for our tradition that is rooted in this Jewish understanding of God's holiness, that we do not use the name of God lightly, even if it's in worship. I was going to say, because even if we're doing it with respect in our heart, it's still not the proper way to do it. I know. Even as I'm talking on the radio here today, it is uncomfortable to say that word, oh. to say the tetragrammaton, because there is such a holiness. It's like, I want to be very, very careful yeah. when talking about God. And incidentally, the, the early Christians had a very similar way of talking about Jesus. When the Son of God became incarnate, and again, these are all mysteries that we're going to talk about later, yeah. but when Jesus took on our humanity and received a human name, the name Jesus, that name, after the, the resurrection, they, they called, the, those first Christians called themselves followers of the way, that Jesus called himself the way, the truth, and the life. So we're followers of the way. They didn't want to use his name, or they were preaching the name, or they were glad to be persecuted for the name, that, that they didn't speak the name Jesus just regularly or or without cause. Mm-hmm. In fact, what they did call him was Adonai. They used the same name, the same title that we spoke about God in the Old Testament. They called him that in the New Testament, but they weren't speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Greek. So the word Adonai, it translates to Lord, And what those first Christians who spoke Greek would say is they would call him Kyrios, which meant Lord. Now, if you think at Mass, there's one place in Mass where we use that word, and it's after the I confess to Almighty God. And then sometimes instead of saying, Lord, have mercy, we will say, Kyrie eleison. That's not Latin. Many people think that that's Latin. It's the only part of our liturgy that is still in Greek. And the reason it is in Greek 
is because it is the oldest title that Christians gave to Jesus. They called him Lord, Kyrie, which reflected the Adonai of the Old Testament. So it's ancient, it's old, and it's super significant. So when we can use Kyrie eleison at Mass, we're tying back to this really ancient understanding of the holiness of God's name that we don't take lightly. Let's bring the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the great job of wrapping everything up. So we've discussed Father and Son and Holy and Father and Son particularly and their relationship. And when we bring the, the, the Holy Spirit always, always, always unites the persons of God and reveals the persons of God. So the, the, the Spirit's role also seen throughout the Old Testament. We have images, as I said, the Spirit breathing over the waters in creation, uh, the, the breath of God that is felt that, that the Spirit is, is that moving part that's always keeping things fresh, always keeping things alive. And that Spirit is in the Old, or in the New Testament as well, that we see images of the, the Spirit that reveal Christ and reveal the Father. And so as we think about this God who is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, it's a mystery that we can only begin to understand, but we have to let the Spirit begin revealing him to us. We will look at each of the, we'll look at uh, of Christ uh, and his mission separately. Mm-hmm. We'll go on to talk about the Holy Spirit and his mission beyond that. So we'll dive much more deeply as we go along into these persons of the Holy Trinity, particularly Son and Spirit and what the Father sent them to do. Tune in next week for another episode of Cat in the Cradle, Catechesis for Cradle Catholics with Father Jeffrey Loski. Right here on the Spirit Catholic Radio Network, a production of Spirit Catholic Radio.